Well, folks, we have a couple of Sundays before we get into our fall series on the Gospel of Mark. So I'm going to do them to, to do what I love to do the most and what I also think is the most helpful. And that's just to study a book or two of the Bible. Now, you've heard people talk about some small towns and say, you know, when you go, go by, don't blink or you'll miss it. Well, I was tempted to entitle this little two-week series, The Books Where We Blinked. Because we're going to look at two books in the New Testament that I suspect that, that many of you uh, may have never read and might have trouble finding in your Bible. One commentator I read uh, noted, to this day, most churches could function a whole lifetime without second or third John in their Bibles and never miss their absence. In fact, these books are, to call them what they really are, letters, are so short that, that in each of the next two Sundays, we're going to read the whole book. And now, now, don't be too worried. Today's reading of the second letter of John is only 13 verses. You can read it in about a minute. And because they're so short, they don't give us much information or context to help us understand them. I've told you before that sometimes reading the letters of the New Testament is exactly like what it is, reading somebody else's mail. Well, this letter is so short, it presents even greater problems. That same author I noted said, reading 2 John is not simply like hearing one side of a phone conversation. It's like hearing one side of a phone conversation that's bleeding in and out of your phone from a cellular transmission somewhere of somebody else. So before we read this text message-sized book, let me give you a little background that I think will help you understand what we're reading. Um, for most of its history, the Apostle John has been identified as the author of this letter. Many modern critics don't believe John had anything to do with these books that bear his name, but I believe they're mistaken and that these books and letters do trace their way back to John the Apostle, the son of Zebedee, who spent most of the final years of his life in the city of Ephesus, ministering to the church there and establishing relationships with churches in the surrounding province, many of whom were, were started by Paul or, or people who followed Paul. Now, in the fourth century, there was a scholar named Eusebius who tells us that there was a man named John the Elder who lived in Ephesus about the same time. And you'll see that the author of 2 John identifies himself as the elder. Now, elder is simply the word presbyterioi, from which we get Presbyterian. It is a term of respect and also a specific term for leaders in the early church. Uh, it's found 67 times in the New Testament, used for lots of people. There is not one shred of history or tradition that would connect anyone else but John the Apostle, who would have been aged at this time uh, when he wrote the letter, but there's nothing else to connect anybody else to the letter. And by the way, uh, you know, history is strange, but that single comment by Eusebius was, became the source of an elaborate Middle Ages legend that grew up uh, about a figure that was, became known as Prester John and the hope that he would save the West from the infidels. I Google it. I don't have time to talk about it today. But I do think most people believe this, that it was written between 80 and 98, 5 AD, during the time the Apostle John was in Ephesus. And I'm almost sure it was not during the time that he was imprisoned on the island of Patmos. There's lots of good reasons to believe that. Some suggest that both 2nd and 3rd John were personal letters that were written to accompany the longer 1st uh, letter of John, since they seem to deal with similar problems, use similar language, similar wording, uh, they would have been given to specific individuals um, that as the longer First John was circulated to a broad range of churches, they were sent along with that to be given to these individual people in two churches. And, and actually, I think this is likely. It fits well with what we know, but it's no more than a good guess. So enough to get us started. Let's read the letter itself. So here we are. Uh, the letter of 2 John. You can follow along in your Bibles if you wish. The elder to the elect lady and her children, who I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. I rejoice greatly to find that some of your children are walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though we were writing you a new commandment, but the one that we have heard from the beginning, that we love one another. 
And this is love, that we walk according to his commands. This is the commandment, just as you have heard it from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting. For whoever greets him takes part in his wicked work. Though I have much to write you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greet you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, let me just quickly run through what I think we know uh, the background here is about. John is at Ephesus, and we know from 1 John and Revelation that there were already false doctrines being introduced into Christian churches. Remember, this is a time before the New Testament existed in the form we have it now, before all the church councils, but at a time when most of the first generation followers of Jesus had died. And John writes, it has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in truth, just as the Father commanded. Now, traditionally, many believe this letter was written to a woman in the church outside of Ephesus. Um, and uh, John calls her the chosen lady, Ecclita e- e- Kyria. Note that the term chosen, that's the title, that's chosen or elect, uh, fits in well with our Reformed theology of understanding. Um, people scratch their head about this, but I actually tell you, I think it makes more sense to see this as a language that refers to a sister church of the Ephesus congregation somewhere else in Asia Minor. Especially since at the end of the letter, John mentions the children of your chosen sister, which is pretty obviously in the context of the congregation in Ephesus. Now we read that John is saying that he has either met or heard news from people of this church. He calls them children of his sister's church and found that, that they have not strayed from the original message of the gospel. But perhaps they asked questions of him or warned John about others in the church. We don't really know, but if John did hear about trouble, it would explain why a need for a short, quick note uh, that was rather to the point to be sent rather quickly to them. And John makes basically two points in this letter, main points. In in John's uh, three short letters, he uses the word love, and that's the word that most of you know in Greek, agape, 42 times. Now, that is far more times than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts combined. And he leads with that here. Now, dear lady, I'm not writing you a new commandment, but one we have heard from the beginning. I ask that you love one another. But then he goes on to define what he means by love. And I think this is important. He says, and, and this is love, you know, uh, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. So pay very close attention to that because it's important. Love is just not free-form feeling uh, like we assume it is. Love in the church is not just sloppy agape, as a friend of mine calls it. True love takes its shape and form from doing uh, what follows the gracious guidelines for living that God has given us. Uh, Up in verse 3, the very beginning of the letter, you know, John connects truth and love, you know, in in his greeting. Grace, mercy, and peace be with us from God the Father and Jesus the Son in truth and love. Puts them together. John's mind, the two cannot be separated. Hold on to this because we're going to come back to it. But next, John swings into a very specific and forceful warning about people in the church who are trying to bring in false ideas. And he doesn't beat around the bush. He has zero tolerance for what these people are doing. He calls them deceivers, which is an interesting word Uh, in Greek, it's planos. It's another one of those Greek words you know, but you didn't know you knew. Uh, it comes into Latin from Greek is planta, uh, planata. That root is the meaning, the root of that meaning is wanderer. And it's that word from which we get our English planets. Because the planets wander through the skies, unlike the more predictable stars, even times seen to move backwards. And they deceive the observers into thinking they're regular stars. 
John says these are people like the stars that have wandered off course and have gone their own way. And then he gets real specific about their error. He writes in verse 7, Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is a deceiver and an anti and the Antichrist. Now, if you've been around here a while, you know that we have talked about the Greek philosophical ideas about body and spirit. Basically, from Plato onward, the major stream of Greek thought thought that the physical world was either irrelevant or downright evil. And it was the world of the spirit that was pure and good and ultimately important. Eventually, this gets developed into a full-blown system called Gnosticism, which tries to save your spirit from an evil physical world. Now, some Greek Christians began to blend Gnostic ideas with the teaching of the apostles, making Jesus a great spirit being who came to the physical evil earth to save us. But they could not abide with the idea that a pure being of spirit who actually took on human flesh and became a real human. So they claimed that Jesus must have only appeared in human form, never really took on flesh. He was never crucified. And what appeared after the resurrection was simply the spirit body well, that he had all along. You can see how very different that is from, from what Christianity teaches. So John lets both, loose both barrels against them. Uh, these people are both deceivers and the Antichrist, which I might add is a problem if you think the Bible only talks about one Antichrist. Um, no time to jump on that horse today. But then John piles it on. Don't follow these people because you might lose your salvation. Don't teach this falsehood, because if you do, you will lose your relationship with God. Don't let the people who teach this in your house or in your church. And remember, if you give them assistance, you share in their evil work. Not a whole lot of room for debate there, is it? And John knew what well, we kind of had to relearn with the spread of COVID. You know, you can't let the infection spread by contact. Use all measures to stop it before it creates a pandemic in the church. That's his main message here. Now, let me finish this morning with just a few reflections and applications. God, John, John holds two things together that I think we need to be careful that we don't break apart, and that is truth and love. I think most of us know people who are so determined to be right that even when they are right, we still can't stand to be around them. Yeah, you're all shaking your head and laughing because you know those people, right? You know, back in the 1920s and 30s, at a critical time in the Presbyterian Church, there was a man named J. Gresham Machen. He was a distinguished New Testament scholar at Princeton Seminary, staunch defender of the historical reliability of the Bible. He worried about the effects of liberalism on the Presbyterian Church, and he fought hard to keep the church on the right path. For the most part, Machen had the right beliefs. Um, but Machen was a bit self-righteous and at times downright obnoxious. In fact, he was so ungracious at times that he alienated the vast center of the church, who mostly agreed with him. And he was eventually forced to leave the church in the mid-30s. Many historians say now that if Majin had been more gracious, exhibited some degree of love for those he opposed, he probably would have easily won the day. And in the long run, perhaps, saved the church from some of the trials that we have continued to deal with to today. So truth without love brings only heat without light. And it's fair to say that too often the church has held up the truth and forgot about love and hurt people along the way. But the opposite is even more true, especially today. To love without standards, to accept what God rejects because we want to be nice, uh, to love without some set of boundaries, carries with it all the dangers that John mentions. Uh, I read an interesting article uh, that was part of a study that George Barner wrote about faith in America. And as the second main point of the study, he writes this. He says, faith in American context is now individual and customized. Americans are comfortable with an altered spiritual experience as long as they can participate in the shaping of that faith experience. You see, we no longer believe in objective truth or that Christianity offers something unique. So we want to be able to shape our own spiritual reality with all of the elements that we find most attractive. Uh, define our own sense of morals and only the values we choose to embrace and therefore reject all the others. You know, sometimes it's called cafeteria Christianity. But the cafeteria part is right, but the Christianity part isn't. 
And this is exactly what the deceivers that John writes about were doing. They were mixing the gospel with Greek Gnosticism, coming up with a hybrid that must have looked highly attractive to them, made a whole lot more sense to them. But John knows better, and he sees the danger. And just as many people today mix our cultural standards and beliefs with the historic Christian faith, we do that to make it more palatable to us. And, and the things that John said then are just as true to us today. We really have to hold on to these two commands to be loving, but also to be faithful. And it's not easy today when only the love part of the equation seems to be valued. You know, we live in a culture that is convinced that they know better, a better way than God does. And we, when we suggest to someone that, that they might be wrong, well, then we're accused of being narrow, bigoted, uneducated, or unloving. And frankly, I can only imagine what the Gnostics were saying about John. So when you're the one wandering, though, well, let me tell you, it's not easy to see where your wanderings might lead you. And that's what John warns about. I remember a few years ago, there were two different families one winter that got stuck in the snow on isolated Northwest Forest Service roads. And they were very lucky to be saved. Both of them had the same story. They were simply following the directions of their GPS, who led them turn by turn onto narrow, unmaintained Forest Service roads because it automatically selected the shortest route between two places. It would be like having your GPS direct you from Ellensburg to Wenatchee in the winter via Clockham Pass Road. And I've had that happen before. Yes, it's shorter. Really bad idea. And if you've ever used the GPS, you know that what you see on the screen is just a very small close-up of the big picture. If these people had been able to see the big picture of where the GPS was taking them, they would never have followed it. But they never looked at the big picture. And likewise, these wanderers that came to deceive both themselves and others in the church probably never saw how their small decision affected the big picture. Gregory of Nazianzus, one of the great people we call the Cappadocian father, Cappadocian fathers in the fifth century wrote, what he, and you're talking about Jesus here, what he did not assume, he could not redeem. If Jesus was not fully human as he was divine, he could not save us. John knew that. He knew that the small step the wanderers were taking would ultimately lead them to a savior that had no power to save. And by the way, one of the reasons I keep pushing you towards knowing and using a catechism is that one of the things it does is it helps us to see our faith always from the big picture, not from just one specific verse. We're going to talk about that, uh, how that goes wrong next week when we took it, third John. So finally, friends, let me just let me tell you, don't take the shortcut however attractive it is, however good they look. Hold on to both truth and love. Don't sacrifice one for the other. Remember that both what we do and what we believe matters. And just like John tells us, walk in the truth. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have reminded us that both truth and love are, are important and cannot be separated. And whenever we hold on to the truth so hard that we forget to be loving, we ask that you would soften our hearts. And whenever we simply grasp love and forget that there must be truth behind it, sharpen our minds. And thank you for this reminder that John wrote to someone so long ago that's still so important to us today. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, go from this place and walk in God's truth and love together, for there is no other true way. And may his grace, his mercy, his peace, and his blessing be with you now and forevermore.